Welcome back, everyone. More than a billion pets live in homes around the world. But seriously, do you know why dogs spin around when excited? If parrots actually understand the words they speak? Or if cats truly love us? <laughs> Our next guest asks the questions we've all had but never knew science could answer. In his new book, The Science of Pets, please welcome veteran broadcaster and best-selling author, Jay Ingram. Welcome back to the show. The definition of a pet can get kind of murky, and it's something that you get into right at the beginning of the book. So how do we define, or do you define, a pet? Could I make a quick comment about um, love at first sight? Oh, yes, yeah. first, please do. That happens with pets all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody goes in, they might want to, they actually don't even want a pet, just want to look at the pets in the shelter. <gasps> I have to have That's that pet. Dog. So if we could understand how that works in humans, Maybe we'd understand, or vice versa. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. definition of pet. I think it's any living thing that you treat as a companion in one way or the other. Now, obviously, it's very different. If you have dogs and you have cats, you really do feel like there's a bond. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. And I think it's mostly because you think you know what they're thinking. Yeah. yeah. And you think they love you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But really, there's no scientific evidence. We don't know what goes on in their brains. Uh, on the other hand, if you have, like I used to have a pair of lizards. I didn't really have a relationship with them. <laughs> you know, it was fun to feed them and they jump around and everything. But still, I consider them my pets. Like, I kept them alive. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's different levels. And I think the cutoff is kind of, do I think I know what they're thinking and are they thinking about me and do they love me? Yeah. <laughs> Once you think good. that, you can be, you can have anything. It's you true. can have a pet rock. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. You know what I love about this, Jay, is you actually in the in the book go back and trace humans' relationship with pets. Uh, so where did the idea of a pet or the first pets appear? We're we're never gonna know exactly how far back it goes. The oldest fossil bones of an animal that is unambiguously a dog and not a wolf mm. is 14,200 wow. years old. Wow. The, old, the oldest cat remains, and this was a cat buried with a human, so you know yeah. probably a pet, is about 11,000 years. So that's wow. a lot. But think about this. Let's say the oldest dog that we found is 14,000. There have to have been dogs right. before that. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it kind of gets murky because... Fossils like that are very, first of all, it's hard to distinguish an ancient wolf from an ancient dog because mm -hmm. the transition is very slow. Mm -hmm. So it could be 20,000 years, could be more than that. Wow. The thing is, in every country in the world where there are humans, there are animals that they think are their pets. Wow. Okay. Uh, can we talk about the human-animal bond? Because I feel like my cat Thomas um, sometimes knows what I'm feeling. <laughs> uh, so can pets like cats and dogs sense our moods in measurable ways, though? Uh, so that's a good point about the measurable. Um, but I think you, as you get to know your pet, will be able to tell whether your pet is uninterested in you or is hungry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's most dogs most of the time. Yeah. Um, and so I think you can make some guesses. But what they're actually thinking, like, look, if my dog nuzzles me, maybe he wants a treat. Maybe he doesn't, re he just thinks I'm a vehicle for dispensing <laughs> treats. But sometimes they come up to you like when you're crying. Yeah, they sense yeah. our moods. And lay next to you. I think, yes, I think that that happens. Um, the trick is, and the hard part about writing this book was, um, have people done experiments to determine that? So, you know, you have a, a group of people crying, but with animals that aren't pets, are they attracted to oh, that? You know, where, and, the, and the cats are. I, I mean, I definitely think there are pl plenty of informal examples of animals responding to the mood to, of people. And certainly if an o a pet owner is angry, animals sense that. Yes. But let me give you a quick example if I can. People think that animals, especially dogs who have stolen food, feel guilty. Yeah. Yeah, so what really happens, and this has been proven, is that you know the, the, the food is put out, the dog is told not to eat it, the person leaves the room, the experimenter takes the food out, so it looks like the dog has eaten it, 
the owner comes back in and the dog, the owner swears the dog looks guilty, but the dog has read the owner's expression. Oh. Yeah. And it's like this, because it knows bad things are gonna happen. Yeah. So. They're reacting to us. So you, yeah. Yeah. you know what, yeah. the whole story of pets is, don't focus so much on the pet, focus on the human with the pet. Wow, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Because my love dog that. stole sandwiches all the time and she never looked guilty and she drank coffee. <laughs> she was fine with it. All That's right, so probably because you never punished her. No, no, I didn't punish her. Yeah, yeah. So there she you go. Have it. All right, so there's another chapter in your book called Bring Him Back Alive, which delves into cloning pets. So when you clone Puddles, if that's the name of your pet, is that actually bringing Puddles back? Puddles will never come back exactly as the original Puddles was because right. so much of uh, any animal's behavior and any human's behavior mm -hmm. is not 100% genes, which is what you'd replicate with cloning, but the way they're raised. Right. And uh, Barbara Streisand had a, a very rare breed of dog that she loved because of its really lovely little coat. Cute. Yeah. And um, she got two dogs that successfully cloned. Neither of them had the coat that she wanted. Wow. And neither of them actually behaved. Oh. And so, yes, you can get a dog that probably looks much like the original, yeah. but it will never be exactly the same. Right. Wow. Wow. Okay, Jay, we have less than a minute left, but we want to ask you this. The like, humans are literally shaping their pets, as we've discussed, so which yep. begs the question, what do you think the future of pets will look like uh, as we continue on this path? Like, what's Ooh. the future look like? Well, you know, that's going to be hard to say because 200 years ago, nobody would have predicted the array of dog breeds that we see today. Mm -hmm. One thing that is going to happen, you know, some breeds are actually unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From the get-go. Right. Uh, and governments and veterinarians around the world are starting to recognize, look, you may want a, a dog with a really pushed-in face, but that dog is going to have breathing mm -hmm. and digestive mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that really a reasonable thing for us to do? I don't think so. Yeah. So... I think it's unpredictable. Unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, thank you so much for joining oh, us today. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, the science of pets. It hits shelves November 4th. But guess what, studio audience? You're going home with your very own copy today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hey, you, come a bit closer. We've got so many more must-see interviews, spicy debates, lifestyle tips, and pop culture moments. So subscribe to our channel by tapping the logo below and don't miss out.